this evening we want to pick up with our study on the Holy Spirit and we want to focus this evening uh, on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 1, in verses 1 and 2, we read that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's a couple of things significant in this. And that is, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, the word for God there is Elohim, which is a term that is used uh, particularly of God in His role as the Creator, identifying Him as the Creator, and is generally translated God. But it can be used for other beings, uh, you know, lowercase gods and, and so on. But here in particular, one of the things we see that Elohim is a plural form. In the beginning, Elohim, the plurality created, it's a singular verb. Now, grammatically speaking, that would be considered incorrect. You know, rules of grammar, your, your subject and verb are to agree. And so if you have a plural subject, you have a plural verb. If you have a singular subject, you have a singular verb, you know, form of the verb. But theologically, this is correct. And in that sense, it is also grammatically correct to say Elohim, referring to the Godhead, in which there are three persons in the Godhead, acting as one. These three are one. And so that is brought out in verse 1. Verse 2, we see the Holy Spirit singled out and identified as working in the creation. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. As we pointed out in our previous message on the Holy Spirit, being the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit has always existed and has been a part of what, whatever God is doing. Uh, when God acts, He acts, it, it, there's a unity there, and all persons of the Godhead, all three persons we see here, are present in this act. And so we see God the Father, we see God the Holy Spirit. According to the Gospel of John chapter 1, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word of God was present. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And without Him there was not anything made that was made. So all three persons are seen present here in uh, the creation. Uh, we see the presence, power, and participation of the Holy Spirit in the creation, which includes the creation of man, Adam. In Genesis 1.26, we find a statement where God said, and God said, and here again, Elohim, let us, there's a plural, make man in our image. Again, the plural after our likeness, and let them have dominion, and goes on. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. And so we see how he says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Chapter 2 and verse 7, and the Lord God, and I hear, I find it interesting. All through the creation, God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God made, God said, 
God said let us, you know. Uh, all through that. But here, in verse 7, it says the Lord God. And that is significant. Because here it is Jehovah Elohim. We see Jehovah is the special name of God. It identifies Him as the eternal self-existing One and is always used in reference to God in His covenant relationship with His people. Now there's no covenant relationship between Him and all the rest of the creation, but there is a special covenant relationship between Him and man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The breath of life. Nish alma, a puff, a wind, breath, divine inspiration, spirit. So I believe we see again the idea, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We see body, soul, and spirit. And it is God's Spirit that gave life to man. God breathed. And we see the application that we see the reference to the Holy Spirit here in another sense when we read over in 2 Timothy 3.16 where Paul declares to Timothy all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Literally it means God breathed. And, we, and that's in the Greek but we see here in the Hebrew that one of the uh, ideas of uh, associated with this Hebrew word is that of inspiration. And we see that same concept in the New Testament in the Greek when he said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God or God breathed. In 2 Peter 1.20 Again, following this thought about inspiration, the Holy Spirit, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, there's a lot of spiritual writings out there in the world. But here, Peter is addressing the Scripture. And that there, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That is, it did not come by the will of man. Uh, it did not come from the thoughts of man. He goes on to say, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here we see the word move, which means to, to carry, to bear, to uh, along. As they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Paul says in Timothy, God breathed. God's Spirit breathed into them the words that He wanted spoken. These men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't their own interpretation. It wasn't their will. It was the will of God as manifested by the Holy Spirit that moved or breathed into them the Word of God. And so, we see the presence, life-giving power of the Spirit of God in the creation of Adam in that He was created in the image and likeness of God. And we see some of the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament when it came to uh, individuals and the inspiration to speak and write the Scriptures. 
as we have already mentioned, and those quotes in uh, Timothy and Peter was in reference to the Old Testament Scriptures. I wasn't talking about so much. It, I believe it included uh, them as the New Testament Scriptures were being written, as the, they, these things were being spoken, even as uh, Paul and Peter penned these words. I believe the same applies to them, but they were particularly referring to the Old Testament Scriptures which they had at that time. And such as David, notice if you will the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was speaking, and Peter was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That was the whole thing here on the day of Pentecost, and we'll come back to that thought a little bit later. In Acts chapter 2, verse 25, Peter brings up as an example David and quotes David. He said, For David speaketh concerning him, that is, concerning the Christ. Now we've already read, and Peter's already said, well, I say already, we've, we've already read that, but what we're looking at here in Acts was spoken before what he wrote in 1 Peter, 2 Peter. But a, the very thing he spoke about there, these men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It did not come by the will of man. And so he is... Uh, Speaking of David, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now here, verse 29, Peter begins to make the application and explain what David was talking about. He says, Men and brethren, let me speak uh, freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. What he's pointing out here is that when David said this, he wasn't talking about himself. You remember uh, the eunuch, and he was reading in Isaiah, and he asked Philip, of whom is the prophet speaking? Is he speaking of himself or somebody else? Well, he's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's whom David is speaking of here. Uh, he said, therefore, verse 30, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. And so he's saying, now, now David, knowing that God had promised that of his seed, of his descent, the Messiah was going to come and the Messiah was going to sit upon his throne. But also, I believe it's implied, knowing that he would be crucified. You know, this, we was talking about this morning in Sunday school how they ran all this together and they didn't understand that when the Messiah came, uh, the first of it, that, that he was coming twice. He's coming as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world and he's coming as the line of the tribe of Judah to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And they was looking for the second coming and therefore rejected him at his first coming. But evidently David understood this. And he was speaking because he knew that the Messiah would come from his seed, but that he was going to be crucified. He was speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he might then in turn fulfill that promise. 
Therefore, verse 30 again, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And so see how he used David there. Now, what did he say? These, all the scriptures given by the inspiration of God, it's God breathed. And these holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. Now notice 2 Samuel. Now these, I always use these three verses together. Timothy, Peter, and Samuel. 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. And that's verse 1 and 2. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. See, as a prophet, and that's how uh, Peter identifies him here, being a prophet, not only was he a king, but he was a prophet. And that was the thing. There are three offices that were ordained, that men were anointed, I should say, to that office. That of a prophet, that of a priest, and that of a king. David was anointed as king, but we see also that he was a prophet. Now we see Moses was a prophet, but he was not a king. He was of the priestly tribe. His brother Aaron was the high priest. But he ministered mostly as a prophet to Israel. And so we see examples of these. And some men, uh, we see Melchizedek was a, a priest and a king. Uh, but there was only one who's anointed to all three offices. That's the Messiah, the anointed one. And he fulfills all three of these offices. He's prophet, priest, and king. And anyway, we see David being a, a prophet here spake. And he said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me. The, the last words of David. And he's saying, you know, when I spoke, it was the spirit of the Lord spake by me. His word was in my tongue didn't come by any private interpretation. And so we see here uh, the work of the Holy Spirit and present in the Old Testament, working with these men, with these saints, these prophets and kings. The inspiration of the Scripture, the Word of God, is just one work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Now, many failing to rightly divide the word of truth have misunderstood and falsely taught that the Holy Ghost was not given in the Old Testament based primarily upon this one verse, John 7, 39. And we'll share this with you and show, I hope, demonstrate, how that there is no problem, there's no contradiction between this and what we've already shown and studied, and, and we'll show some more, it is just a this idea taking this verse out of context and misapplying it, they're teaching false doctrine concerning the Holy Spirit. John 7 39. Uh, well, let's back up just a, a little bit. Verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, 
Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And they take that verse and say, before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was not given to anybody. Well, how are men saved? Oh, you hath he quickened or been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. All have sinned. And it takes the Holy Spirit to quicken and make someone who's dead in trespasses and sin alive. And so, what of the apostles who were saved before the day of Pentecost? They didn't have the Holy Spirit before then. Matter of fact, there's one occasion where Jesus blew on them and said, Receive my Spirit. That was before the day of Pentecost. We believe, and I believe the Bible clearly teaches, that men in the Old Testament were saved exactly the same way. There was not a, a separate basis of salvation in the Old Testament that is different from the basis of salvation in the New Testament. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Men are said to have found grace. He talks about being uh, born again in the Old Testament. You know, that was not just something that was newly uh, stated by Jesus in the New Testament when he told Nicodemus, You must be born again. He said, You being a ruler of the Jews ought to already know this. Because it was in the Old Testament scriptures where it talks about uncircumcised of heart and mind. In other words, you may be religious, you may be a child of Abraham, but you haven't been born again. You have not been regenerated. It takes regeneration. It took regeneration in the Old Testament. It takes regeneration in the New Testament. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what this is talking about, it's not referring to the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in its entirety, but a specific ministry of the Spirit as given to the Lord's churches to endue them with power to be His witnesses. Now it is quoting Proverbs 18.4. So first of all, let us go back to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 4. Where it says, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Now it talks about his words and, and the, the source of wisdom. And this comes from the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus makes that statement, he is quoting Old Testament Scripture. Now, let's notice the Gospel of John chapter 14. Verse 25 and 26. These things have I spoken to do, being yet present with you. Um, I was looking for, I, I think it's later that he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now he's made a, a couple of comments here in this chapter. Identify the Holy Spirit as being one with him. Uh, in verse 17 18, uh, Well, verse 16 says, I will pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter. Well, if there's another comforter, that means 
there was another one before that. And I believe, as I understand the word here in the Greek for another, means another one just like me. The Father will give you another comfort that He may abide with you forever. Why? Because Jesus was ascending back to the Father. And it was to take His place with the disciple, with his, his church. I'll build my church. Now the ministry of the church is something that is distinct and a particular ministry that is given to it in this world. And the work of the comforter that he's discussing here is the work of the Holy Spirit empowering his church. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelt. Notice what he says here. In John 14, before the day of Pentecost, the Comforter, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. So the Holy, they already had the Holy Spirit and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So in a, whatever sense that the Holy Spirit is coming as a comforter, that is Jesus Christ coming to be with His church. And so we read verse 26. Jesus said these things, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Uh, chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So he's saying, it, I can't return to you as the Comforter in the, the person of the Holy Spirit until I have ascended back unto the Father. Once I have ascended unto the Father, and he speaks of it in the sense of both the Father sending the Holy Spirit and He sending the Holy Spirit, and He being the Comforter that's coming to them, Verse 13 says, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. And, and so that, in Proverbs, we he's talking about it, a well of wisdom, a source of knowledge. The Holy Spirit is that source that He teaches us and He guides us into all truth, and He brings back into our remembrance so that this is the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit in a particular sense, not just with individual believers, but a ministry that is given to the Lord's church for that purpose. In Luke chapter 24... Luke 24... Uh, and go back to verse 46. Let us start reading with verse 46. Luke 24, 46. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now this is Luke's account of the commission being given to the church. Matthew uh, 28 verses 18 through 20 is his account of the commission. Verse 4, And ye are witnesses of these things. And 
behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So he has built his church. He has established his church. He has placed apostles in his church. He has given them a commission. And he, he was present with them. But now for a period of time, he's going to ascend back into the Father. And there's no comforter with them. I think it was, what, 10 days? Because Pentecost was 50 days after the resurrection. Jesus walked upon the earth for 40 days after his resurrection. And he ascended, and ten days after that was the day of Pentecost. For those ten days, the church was without its comfort. The individuals had the Holy Spirit. They'd been quickened, made alive, born again. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with them. But as a church... <coughs> the Comforter had not yet come and actually, in a sense, returned because the Comforter was with them when Jesus was present with them during His ministry. But now we see the Holy Spirit taking up that role of Comforter and in doing them with power. And the Old Testament likeness, if you will, of this in the book of Exodus was with the tabernacle. Now, again, we see there was the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. There is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and the covenant relationship and the creation of Adam. We see the Holy Spirit all through the Old Testament, different ones. I will look at a few examples of this. But in Exodus chapter 40, verse 17, And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. So they had received instructions. Uh, Moses on the mount had received instructions. He came down. Uh, they received them again, and they and he delivered those instructions to the children of Israel. They they gathered the materials. They worked and they assembled all the individual parts of the tabernacle. And now everything's being put together, put in its place, set in order. And there's type of the church in that this was the house of God or the tabernacle of God in the wilderness it's equivalent it's not a continuation of it but there is a parallel and equivalency in some ways as Paul said to Timothy that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of God the living God the pillar and ground of the truth that each of these was the, the symbol of God's presence and ministry to His people. It was the source of truth. It was the source of their sanctification. It was the source of their uh, being taught if they had any questions. They, they desired to know the will of God. This is where they would come and God would make it known to them. And the tabernacle was replaced by the temple. And there we see many allusions to the church being likened unto a temple, a spiritual temple and habitation of God through the Spirit. And there again, in referring to the church being a building, a temple, built up of living stones and becoming an habitation of God through the Spirit. Well, anyway, in Exodus, um, 
Verse 18, Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the golden altar in the tent of the congregation before the veil, and he burnt sweet incense thereon as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set up the hanging at the door of the tabernacle, and he put the altar of the burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered upon it burnt offering and the meat offering as the Lord commanded Moses. And he set the laver between the tent of the congregation and the altar, and put water thereon to wash withal. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat. When they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near into the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. And when that work was finished, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter in to the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud went not, uh, were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was upon it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. That's the Holy Spirit. It came upon the tabernacle when all was finished and set in order. The Holy Spirit came upon the tabernacle and was it led them, it guided them, it it told them when to move and where to move and when to stop and when to set up camp. And so it was a distinct ministry of the Holy Spirit manifested only upon the tabernacle. That particular work of the Holy Spirit was only manifested upon the tabernacle during its journeys. When they got to the land, it was taken up. Now, especially as we look at the tabernacle and the wandering in the wilderness as compared to us in this world, our journeys here, when the Lord returns, we're going to be taken up. And the Holy Spirit, in that sense in which He came on the day of Pentecost, will be taken up. The glory of the Lord. And as I was thinking about that, I thought of this verse I, I've quoted many times, and I hadn't quite thought of it in this way. Ephesians 3 21. Unto Him be glory in the church. Where is the glory? It's in His church. Who leads, who is present in the church to lead us, to lead the worship, to lead in prayer, to lead in singing? Brother Ben, we, we do have a, another song leader. It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Of course, that doesn't help your, your voice but, uh, that much, but we do have another song leader. One who leads in prayer, one who leads in singing, one who guides and directs our, our worship. 
to bring glory, uh, to bring that praise and worship. To go unto Him be glory. And where is that glory to be found? It's in His church. Now that's not to say that the Holy Spirit isn't moving and operating outside of and apart from His church. He is, but in different aspects of His ministry and work. Yeah. We believe there are people that are genuinely saved. It means the Holy Spirit convicted them, converted them, brought that quickening, regenerating power to them, has sealed them. But if they're not in the church, they're not where the glory is. Unto Him be glory in the church. i tell you something else. That train of thought. Read in Revelation, new heavens, new earth, and the new Jerusalem, the city of God, adorned as a bride for her husband. And it said, they'll have no need of the sun. God and His Son is the light thereof. And the light radiating out through that city. You can see that glory. The glory of God is going to be the light of the new, earth, new heavens, new earth. And it's radiating out from that city, which is the bride. The home of the bride. It's a bride adorned for her husband. The nations of the saved will walk in the light of it. It was this particular ministry of the Holy Spirit which was poured out upon the Lord's church on the day of Pentecost and remains to minister to the glory of God until the end of the age when He will be removed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 The mystery of iniquity doth now work, but he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What's it talking about? That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe that in the sense, because when He comes, He's going to convict the world of sin. This is part of the work that He does through the church, through the preaching. As we preach the Gospel, as we are witnesses for Him, of sin and judgment and righteousness, And this restrains the work of Satan. He who now leadeth or restrains or hinders, who holds back, will continue to restrain and hold back until he be taken out of the way. I believe that's referring to in the rapture. It's the saints are taken out. His church will be taken out. I don't like to refer to it as the rapture of the church because it's the rapture of the saints because I believe that all those that are saved, whether they're in the church or not, that's that, that Protestant universal church thinking. So it's the rapture of the saints. And they'll be taken out. Obviously, the church is going to go up with them. And with that, that particular ministry of the Holy Spirit, but we see the Spirit of God still working through the tribulation period. The church isn't here. It's in heaven. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit in other aspects is. This is what Jesus was referring to in John. The Spirit not yet being given, which answers to the tabernacle in the Old Testament, which we have looked at. It's a great mistake to say, as many have done, that the Holy Spirit was never in any believer before Pentecost. We have numerous references to individuals in which the Holy Spirit was present. Numbers 27 18.
And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer the priest. And before the congregation goes on, they was ordaining him to take up the role of leadership in Moses' place. But before he was anointed, I said it ordained, but he was being anointed. But before he was anointed, we see that the Spirit was in him. A man in whom is the Spirit. In Nehemiah 9.30, Yet many years didst thou forbear them, talking about the prophets, and testifiest against them, or talk, yeah, about the uh, prophets. Now back up, see if I can see where it references them. Anyway, yet many years didst thou forbear them and testifiest against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. It's talking about the children of Israel and how that God was long suffering with them and testified against them. He said, By thy spirit in thy prophets. So the spirit of God was in the prophets through whom God spake as he rebuked and called the children of Israel to repentance over and over again. Again, 1 Peter in the Old New Testament verifying the very thing that we read there. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. A couple of things. These prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of the grace that would come upon the New Testament saints, upon the Gentiles. And it was the Spirit of God in them that was prophesying through them, and they sought to understand. Now they spake, they recorded these things. It didn't come by the will of man. It was not of their own private understanding interpretation. They looked into it and desired to know what it was that they were speaking. We see the work of the Holy Spirit in, in the governance of ministry as He gave individuals the ability to govern according to their office. In Numbers 27, Matter of fact, when I was reading this, uh, a reference referred to this as to the Sanhedrin. And we were studying, and there was, by tradition, there are 70 men on the Sanhedrin. Well, uh, this is where that tradition began, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, uh, verse 16, 17. And the Lord said to Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, 
and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Now here we see perhaps a distinction between these men and the prophets, and the prophets had said the Spirit of God was in them. Here, and I believe the Spirit of God was in Moses, but there was a ministry of the Spirit to give them wisdom and understanding in judging the people according to the law. A spirit of wisdom. And I believe the Holy Spirit can work upon those that are lost as well as those that are saved. You know, the Bible talks about the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand to turn it with us wherever he will. I believe God has used lost kings and other lost men to accomplish and carry out His will. Who convicted these men? Who put those thoughts in their minds? Who caused them to have these ideas that carried out the will of God? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon them. It wasn't in them, but was upon them. Something of the distinction in the wording here, I believe that makes a difference. Were all 70 of these men saved? I don't know. I don't think that was necessary. But they were chosen because they were leaders and they were to bear the burden of judging the people with Moses. And so that spirit that was upon Moses to judge the people, he said, I'm going to put upon these men too. We see in the book of Judges different ones. Uh, in Judges 3, uh, verses 9 through 11, it talks about the Spirit in Othniel. In Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it mentions the Spirit specifically being in Gideon. In Judges chapter 11, verse 29, it speaks of the Spirit being in Jephthah. And in Judges chapter 15, uh, let's look there, Judges. 15 verse 14. Samson and a particular incident that occurred in Judges chapter 15 verse 14. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Now here again. Uh, this was something that came upon him, the Spirit of God, that gave him strength to rise up and break his bonds and to slay the Philistines. Now verse 19, um, well, in verse 18, and he was sore athirst and called on God and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God claved a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. And so, here we see a work of the Holy Spirit in which He came and went. He came back. I think there are times we can be saved and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, but there are certain ministries that the Holy Spirit may perform upon us and through us and that might be withdrawn. Uh, we may feel His presence and, and, and inspiration and give us strength for a time, for a specific event, for a specific need. And when that need is passed, feel that spirit, that strength wane uh, from us. 
and then again return. So uh, we see different aspects, and understand this, the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit isn't just one thing. <coughs> and it's not one size fits all. The work of the Holy Spirit, there's different aspects of it. There's different manifestations of it. There are some things that He does in and for every believer. And there are some things that is particularly uh, identified as His work with, his, with the Lord's church. And in His church as we come together collectively that His Spirit is upon us. And so on and so forth. And we see that even individually there may be working of the Holy Spirit filling us with His Spirit for an occasion where we, we can just feel filled with His Spirit. But we don't stay filled with His Spirit 24-7. That filling may come and enable us for a time and then we feel it uh, go away. Uh, but then it can come back. So all these things, we see it with the kings. They were anointed as king. David was anointed. The Spirit of God came upon him. And this, that same Spirit that had come upon Saul when he was anointed king was removed from him. There was only one anointed king at a time. Well, we'll kind of stop here, I believe. We have some more thoughts in our notes, but uh, we can pick up there uh, and use that uh, thought uh, to transition into more of the work of the Holy Spirit in us as believers uh, next time. But it is important for us to understand and appreciate the work of the Holy Spirit, but also to be able to recognize the presence and work of the Holy Spirit. As I've said many times before, I think there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of rebellion and disobedience that gets blamed on the Holy Spirit. People want to do things in the energy of the flesh, their own will, their own desires, and try to hide it behind what the Holy Spirit led me to do that. I prayed about it and this is what the Holy Spirit, I feel like the Holy Spirit had me to do. Well, if it's contrary to the Word of God, the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do it. Period. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead any child of God to behave in a way that is contrary to what the Holy Spirit inspired holy men of God to write. That's the reason John warns us to try the spirits to see whether they're of God or not. A spirit might be there, and you might be saved, but a spirit may be present trying to influence you into things you ought not to be doing. But I'll tell you this, Satan knows the Bible better than you do. He knows the Bible. He knows what it says. And he'll quote it. He'll misquote it. He'll take it out of context. He'll do all sorts of things with it to get you to convince you to do something that God's told you not to do. Now, a great example. There was a prophet who was sent to Israel to prophesy against the king and God told him, he said, when you go, you go this way. Don't, come this, don't return the same way you went. And don't stay. Don't stay with anybody. He said, you go, you prophesy, and you come back. Well, there was a prophet up there. And then he was a false prophet. And, you know, false prophets like to get identified with true prophets. False teachers, false prophets like to go to Bible conferences where the truth is preached and get identified and rub shoulders with those that are preaching the truth. And this false prophet said, uh, uh, come, 
come back to my 